In the true crime genre, once a suspect is judged to be guilty, we are generally left on our own to piece together the puzzle as to who that person really was. Some criminals might engage in prison interviews or write books, but such accounts of their lives are hardly trustworthy due to these criminals typically having motives to establish themselves in a certain way, whether it be for fame or to appear remorseful. The case of Samantha Wolford is truly unique in the world of true crime, owing to the fact that she had broadcasted most of her life online via YouTube. We therefore have little need for speculation in determining what kind of person Samantha Wolford was prior to her masterminding the murder of her husband. While I could begin this video with a mini documentary on Wolford, complete with clips from her YouTube channel, YouTubers with better storytelling skills than myself have already done so. Instead, what I offer here is the one thing that seems to be missing on YouTube with regard to Samantha's life and crime, namely the full interrogation of Samantha Wolford. I have obtained the full Samantha Wolford interrogation and remastered the audio for the sake of completing this woman's story. As the main focus of this video is the interrogation, I will only give a brief recap as to who Wolford seemed to be, judging from her YouTube channel prior to her crime. If you want a more in-depth look at Wolford prior to the interrogation, I suggest you give that channel a goo. You know the one. Samantha Wolford gave birth to twins at the age of 19. As a single mom with no financial skill sets, Samantha quickly attached herself to a man. Before her twins were even one year old, she began dating an Ernest Ibarra, having three more children by the time Samantha was 24. Ernest, or Ernie, had to work two jobs to support his seven-person family. Samantha decided that she could help with the family finances by creating a YouTube channel. Samantha's YouTube channel had no particular focus and never gained any traction despite the large amount of time she dedicated to it. Eventually, Samantha's YouTube channel became an obsession, interfering with her parenting responsibilities and family time. Samantha wanted to become a famous YouTuber, yet she had nothing to show for her efforts. Ernie saw Samantha spinning her wheels at the expense of her family and was not pleased. Fights between the couple started and intensified. Samantha got wind that Ibarra was going to leave her and take the children with him. Her solution was to enlist the help of some male friends, who would kidnap and then kill Ernie. On the day of the incident, Samantha made a phone call to her mother and, in a panicked tone, told her that men had just broken into the house, tied her up, and kidnapped Ernie. Samantha's mother called Samantha's aunt, who drove over to Samantha's house to find Samantha gagged and tied up. The police were called, and Samantha was brought into the police station as a witness. Samantha is initially told to wait in the interview room. She immediately falls asleep in her chair. Wakes up to make a phone call. And then repositions herself on the floor for another nap. Although Samantha is technically a witness at this point, her relaxed demeanor after the supposed trauma of having her house invaded and husband dragged away in the middle of the night have alerted the detectives that Samantha is likely involved in the crime. The detectives will thus change their line of questioning to fit that of a suspect, namely looking for inconsistencies in her story.
amounts are available working on this tonight. And everybody in and it's off. You need to help shape them. Anything yet? No, not yet. The, uh, can, let me see, you're, you're, you used to go by Wolford, is that right? Is it Samantha Wolford? What's your date, Brother Sam? 82889. 82889. Now, how long? Uh, and he goes by Ernie Alberta Jr., is that correct? Or that's his, I guess, his park name, Ernie yeah. Alberta. Okay. How long have you And his, like I said, his birth name was Ernie Alberta Jr., is that correct? Ernest. Ernest. Okay. Everybody kind of still calls him Ernie. Little Ernie. Little Ernie. Little Ernie. Like his dad. Okay. And he also goes by, was there a nickname? Dagon. Dagon? Okay. Where would that come from? I don't know. Okay. I'm, everybody assumes it's from the video game World Combat. Mm -hmm. There's a character in there called that, but he's first got it's not. He says it comes from, from Greek style mythological being, but it's not great like Norwegian or something. Fishgod. Fishgod. When did that come about? Where was his nickname? When did that come After he got out of prison. He was, when he got out of prison, he never went by his birth name, unless it was for our purposes. What did he go to prison for? Assault of an officer. Assault of an officer. How much time did he go? A little over a year. Now, was it county town or did he actually go to the state penitentiary? A uh, place in Dallas. Place in Dallas. How long have you and Ernie been together? Six years. Six years. Now, all the kids that were in the house tonight, is those, are those all y'all's together? Or is that uh, younger three are. Younger three. We got together when my daughters were ten months old, my oldest daughters, and they'll be seven next month. Okay. So you got how many kids all together? Five. The, uh, so y'all been together about six years or whatever? Okay. Um, I know there was an incident, I guess it was last year sometime, where I guess one of y'all had gotten into an argument, got into a fight, and he had assaulted you. While Samantha did report a domestic assault in the past, few close to the family believed that Ibarra was actually capable of acting abusively toward his family. In general, treating an alleged victim of domestic abuse with suspicion is dangerous territory, as society has established important safeguards for women in abusive relationships. However, those who know Samantha report her to commonly make unsubstantiated claims and embellish stories as a means of receiving attention from others. From the mere fact that she manipulated three men into kidnapping and murdering her husband with her stories of domestic abuse, we can most likely take the position that Samantha was never really in any real danger in the presence of Ibarra. Yet she continues to use her claims of domestic abuse to paint her husband as a villain and, more importantly, garner sympathy for herself. This is a common trait in people with histrionic personality disorder. Slide the phone out of your hand, the phone while I'm hitting, like it was the youngest one? And the, um, the, baby. the middle one. The, middle one. the youngest. It was the brother to the twin. I keep wanting to say youngest because I, I guess that was you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know, Caden, I just I don't keep forgetting to add him. <laughs> so but that, that he happen? was the baby of the second set of twins. Mm -hmm. okay. So I remember that was kind of a rough time there when y'all were going through that, when he assaulted you. Yeah. And you know, we'd gotten a protective order yes. for you against him to keep him away from you and everything. And, um, so I'm guessing y'all had. I mean, made up with him and got him back together. Mm -hmm. How long after that assault happened did y'all get back together? Uh, a few weeks after the emergency protective order actually was lifted. Okay. In the meantime, um, he found out from some, some judge that he could call me. So he had started calling me, which I told you that. Yes, he can continue calling me, asking what my demands were. What I he had to do to even remotely have me consider him being back in the house with us. Right. So I told me I just take anger management and get help. 
you know, do all of the major random check courses, he completed those on a certificate, sent those up to the judge. Uh, off and on, we Skyped and things being better, and so the first time I actually got to see him, I, it was kind of a spread of thing. I would let him come out, maybe spend the night, try to get him in a few days, and just, so for the first few, two weeks or something, I just mm -hmm. kind of wanted to feel out how he was acting, and, sure. and he came home. Did y'all have any other problems going on in that time frame? Other than just kind of, he's working two jobs, and that's stressful enough, and sure. he wants to come in and gripe at me, and pick at me. Sure. Just that's typical, true. nothing bad. Yeah. So there hasn't been anything else going on as far as, uh, um, you know, you said something about you thought he might have been messing around on your... He just randomly started coming home late. Within the last few weeks, right. every day he's on late. Well, I remember back when that assault happened back in 2014. Um, if my memory serves me correct, that he'd been out at a party or a bachelor. Yeah, party this was and, not late like that. Right, right. I mean, it was the time yeah. back in back in 2014 that he'd been out at a bachelor party. Crowded at Sounds us. Yeah, and was possibly cheating, cheating on you, messing around, and that's what that argument started over. Yeah, well, but he wound up assaulting you and knocking the phone out of your hand, which in, hit the baby. in turn hit the baby in the head. Um, that's what all of that had stemmed from all yes. that. Has there been anything else going on as far as anything yep. else make you would think you might be cheating on him? Other than him just being on late, um, he gives me access to his phone, yeah. his email. He completely asks what about saying there's nothing going on, but I'm already home late every night. What's but your, what's your good so far, I mean, it's back there in my mind saying that, yeah, I kind of thought that was the case, but there's no evidence to show that it was mm -hmm. not like back when that happened, which, of course, after that happens, that's going to be my first sure. shooting. He's already done it once, doing it again. Mm -hmm. But this time, I feel like there's something he hasn't been telling me, but I don't know what. What's your gut feeling tell you? That I think it's something to do with his dad. What do you think would be going on with his dad? I hate, and I'm usually right, and I hate that, but his dad has a problem with getting involved in things that he don't need to be getting involved with. Such as? Drugs. The detectives followed up on this lead that Samantha put out, but found that Ibarro's father was extremely unlikely to have any such ties to drug dealers. Knowing that Samantha likely has histrionic personality disorder, or HPD for short, we can assume that she has chosen Abara's father as a scapegoat for some personal reason. Sufferers of HPD tend to respond to criticism, or even a mere lack of acceptance, with acts of revenge, the level of which most would consider unjustified. Trying to pin a crime on your father-in-law and putting a hit out on your husband are two severe examples of this, and further demonstrate the danger cluster B personality disorders pose to society. He's brought drug addicts to my house. I know for a fact. Like, they are jerked out of their mind. They stop by for a minute. It's been since before the last time he came out, because when I found out his dad was lying to me that he knew his son was cheating on me at that party and he lied in my face, I told him I didn't need anything to do with him after that. So he hadn't been back around. Other than he stopped by, like, two weeks ago for about 10 minutes because he called his son, which is another reason I think there is something to do with his dad. He called his son mm -hmm. on a day off. He works at Little Caesars all weekend. <coughs> One of the reasons he was home late is he had to go up to Little Caesars to pick his dad a pizza up. He didn't even work tonight. He had a was hungry. So you left job A, went by job B, that you don't even work today, had to make your dad a pizza, and what, take it out to his house? No. And then, then it was dropped, and then I was like, why is there a vehicle pulling in the drop? And it was his dad. Just stopped by to pick up a pizza. The pizza that he made for him. Mm -hmm. Well, the 
that factory ain't very far from his dad's house. It's in Talco. His dad's house is in Talco. Mm -hmm. And with all of the things I've heard about Ernie and all of the things he's let slip mm -hmm. about how good he is at dealing, I almost wonder if he wasn't trying to get his son started as one of his old runners and slowly starting him in. I need you to drop this off over at such and such location. I need to drop this off at such and such location. And he was making drops for his dad and bringing the money back. That's why he was so late every day. Has he been using any drugs? No. What about you? No. And I can take a test right now. So you haven't, have you had in the past used any drugs? Me? Hmm. No. Never been involved in uh -uh. cocaine, methamphetamines, no. no. nothing? No. Ecstasy, no, no. no drugs at all. Marijuana? Nope. I tried marijuana once, and it was not for me. I was like 15 and wanting to try things. I might have been 16. I was a teenager rebelling. Mm -hmm. And my parents always told me, no, 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 don't do this. Sure. And the, the feeling it gave me that I'm not in control of myself feeling, I haven't touched a single thing since. The detective is merely looking for any possibility of substance abuse here. Samantha's response discussing her personal experience and feelings toward marijuana is likely a habitual response. Instead of looking at the reasoning behind the question, Samantha listens for an opportunity to talk about herself. Were she more in control of her speech patterns, she would realize that a normal person in her position would simply answer the question so as to proceed with the purported purpose of the interview, which is to provide information that could help her find her husband's whereabouts. Most people with personality disorders, barring psychopathy, should you consider that a personality disorder, find themselves too comfortable during a police interrogation and ultimately give detectives several indicators of guilt. Well, over the last few days, last week or so, has there been between Aaron and Leslie Bates? Have been okay? Other than just... And I've basically just ignored the fact that he comes home late and not said anything because I don't want to sit and argue with him about it or I don't want him to feel like I'm attacking him. Other than him coming in with typical work stresses, he was late to work, so he had a bad day at work and he comes in in a bad mood and dinner's running a little late, so he's snippy. But just typical spouse things, nothing what about severe. Finances have been great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The um, of course, obviously, you understand when something like this happens involving a spouse. Obviously, you know you want to make sure you've seen the news, you've seen deals when yeah, the wife goes missing, you look at the husband, husband, or vice versa. But the wife, you know, if the husband's missing, you look at that. Look at you know, start with their inner core people, family, friends, all that, and then start working our way out. You know, to make sure that. Rule all them out first to make sure that they're... Well, I mean, you've got my family here. You can sure. ask them. My mom talks to me every single day. Mm -hmm. She knows every fight we have, and she also tells me how freaking retarded and funny we are. Mm -hmm. So... Okay. Walk me through today, this or yesterday morning, when you... What, what was your routine yesterday when you got up? Yesterday? God, it seems like so long. Oh, like... Yeah. Like it's 6 a.m. now. Yeah, well, it's yeah, like Thursday morning. Which was yesterday. Um, I got up. Mm -hmm. Things were fine. Kids were in bed because my mom's calling them now. I let them get up. I asked Harley to go get her something to eat because I just bought a bunch of like little handheld things that they could. She could feed themselves sure. breakfast because I don't go out and make breakfast. I'm not one of those moms. I'm not a morning person. I go and make lunch. Breakfast, if you wake up early enough for it, it's not going to be homemade, like, hey, let's go all out. <laughs> so I told her to go down and get something for breakfast. All the other kids was asleep. It was just her awake. She said that she be right back. She went downstairs. She got this box of these little crunchy raisins. I didn't try any, so I don't know why they were crunchy. That's what the box said. Never heard of them. It was the first time we bought them. And she asked if she could have those for breakfast. And they're the individual foil packets. And I said, sure. If that's what you want, sit there and watch TV and I'll take a shower. 
of that same room that they were in. Silver was also awake. While I'm taking a shower, she comes running in there, paddling on her sister for... She went in the fridge and got in the jello. So I had to be me and mom and yell and throw a fit. And then I told them they need to start getting ready. And they started getting dressed because I, a friend of mine had a baby. And I got them all ready to go. Socks, shoes, jackets, etc., etc. It never takes less than an hour to get out of the house. Got them all ready to go. Loaded them up in the car. Went to the hospital. Hung out with her for a while. She had a friend up there with her. And her mother is being crazy right now. And she's released tomorrow. And she had her mother's truck there with her. And she was being released tomorrow morning, or I guess t today sometime. And she started crying because her mom came and took the truck, and she had no idea how she was going to get home. So I told her, have your friend drive me home and drop me off. Keep my vehicle here. Get a ride home. And bring my vehicle back when they get you home, or swing back and pick me up on the way, and then I can drop you off and come back. But i got to get home. She ended up... Uh, being pretty upset that I had to leave her up there because she's having a lot of problems with her baby's daddy and stuff. I came home, we watched the TV, we ate. No big deal, no fighting, everything was normal. He was actually in a really great mood. It wasn't even like, he was, he told me five minutes late to work. And usually that sets his whole day to be hell. Cause he's, I guess been walking a thread line with them on being late and things and so that sets his whole day then and so he's in a pissy mood all day and he was actually in a really good mood um played we have this app we play together I have it on his my phone he has it on his phone we sat and played on our app together um I make cosmetics I started making eyeshadows and stuff so I did that, and he read a book, which, which unless the nightstand got messed up in the whole nine yards, should still be there, sitting on the nightstand, open to the page, like, folded down like he had it, mm -hmm. and then he said a, he had to get in bed because he had to be able to work, he had to work both jobs today, and that, you know, so we went to bed. He went to bed. I was trying to find the remote so that I could watch Vampire Diaries because I'm highly addicted to that show. I ended up not able to find the remote. He had his head all covered up and he was, I thought, asleep. He pulled his head off from under the covers and was like, I can't sleep. Why? Because I can't stop thinking. Well, what about? What's going on? I want you. Like, I'm not going to be able to sleep until I can. So we had sex. Histrionic personality disorder and employing sex as a weapon go hand in hand. For most people, sex and emotion are difficult to tease apart. If you really hated your husband enough to kill him, you'd probably find it difficult to have sex with him. For Samantha, though, sex was merely a tool to pacify her husband so that he would sleep prior to the three men coming into the house to kill him in a few hours. Truly manipulative behavior that would be alien to most of us. Rinsed off in the shower. Got it. I dried up with a towel, threw a shirt on, and my pajama pants, and went to bed. And woke up to that all that chaos. So it was a perfectly normal day. There was nothing out of the... He was late at home from work, but other than that, there would be nothing that... That lately, that's become normal. And I don't even know, like I said, he said, usually it's always in Hastings, he told me that at 2.30, which is an hour before he's supposed to get off work, the design he had made for this new bat had been like an eighth of an inch off, so it was going to cut part of the design off, and then when they shifted it on the bat, it looked completely wrong, so he had to completely redo it. Could be just some big long elaborate lie, or it could be perfectly true, I don't know, but he didn't make it home until like 5.40. But lately that's 
fairly normal. Now, after you went out that sex, now went, got a shower, went to bed, and the kids already asleep. Yeah, they're already asleep. They're already asleep. Okay. The, you remember about what time it was when you went to bed? I looked over at the clock, and it was like 12.01, and I was like, yeah, you've got to get to bed, because you have to be up in five and a half hours. Sure. And you remember about how long after it was when that happened, when you got woke up with whoever was was in the room? I don't know how long they were there, but I do have where I called my mother with my face on my phone. The, uh, so when you were laying there in bed, like you and Ernie there on the bed, you know, far bedroom back there. What, what's your first I guess, memory of what's going on? What's that well, I took an ambulance, so it, it makes it a little harder for me to wake up. Mm-hmm. And I have a prescription with me if you want to see that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I can't sleep, it's supposed to shut your brain down so you can go to sleep, but also make it to where you can wake up fairly easy. Mm-hmm. Of course. I remember at some point it was a little after one. I saw the clock, maybe on my phone, so it it's still pretty foggy because it's fairly early to wake up after taking a sleeping pill. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody grabbing, somebody jerking the blankets down, which startled me, mm-hmm. and then something being pressed against my throat, and they grabbed me by the hair and started jerking me out of bed. I, at that point, wasn't even aware of what was going on with him until he already had me slammed face down on the ground and was tying my hands together. And I rolled my head and looked to the side and could see some commotion going on, but it was pitch black in my room. Samantha considers herself a skilled actor and storyteller. The story that she's giving the detective was likely rehearsed several times. Samantha is smart enough to give clear descriptions of her own physical situation during the struggle while remaining vague about the situation occurring around her. But she failed to realize that her words and her disposition are incongruent. A person who had just hours prior been woken up in the middle of the night, tied up, gagged, forced to strip, forced to watch her husband get beaten, and witness her husband be kidnapped, is unlikely to be telling the story with the emotion of a clothing store employee discussing the difference between mid-rise and low-rise jeans. The detective sees through Samantha, but cannot call her out at this point, due to the story being thus far consistent. And they were all wearing black. The, uh, could you tell if they had anything where they were able to see with, or how they were able to move? One of them had, I don't know if it was attached to their gloves, because they were all wearing gloves. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was like a mechanism that was attached to a glove, or one of those little like headlight things wrapped around their hand, or a flashlight, and it sounds crazy, but it seemed like his hand was open and he had a little bit of light coming, because it was like a little mini flashlight, it was small. Mm-hmm. I don't think he had a cell phone in his hand because I, I, if I am remembering perfectly correctly, I feel like his hand was open and it still had light. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it was something that was attached to his jacket, but that's how they were seeing. And he flashed in my eyes at one point, which made it seem even harder, which is how I know for a fact, like, when he went like this and flashed it in my face, I swear his hand was open, so he wasn't holding on to something. Mm -hmm. And were they saying anything or doing anything when they came into the room? When they were dragging over, what were they saying or what were they doing? The guy that was, they were, it was all guys. I'm, I didn't, I don't remember hearing a female voice. Mm-hmm. And to me, I just about to shut up, bitch. Don't make any noise. Don't make me have to hurt you. Blah, 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 blah. And hold still. Hold your hands together. And I was trying to be as cooperative as possible because I didn't want to die. Mm-hmm. I'll do whatever you say. Just please don't kill me. I've got kids. So when they drag you out of bed, what happens at that point once they drag you out of bed? Drag you to the bed and see me down, floor face down, and press the blade that he had against my throat in my, in between my shoulder blade. And while he's top of tying my hands, 
there's a bunch of fighting going on, but I can't tell who's who or what's going on, just that there's a commotion going on, so I knew that they got to woke up. And then somebody that was dealing with him said, get the fuck out of here, get the fuck out of here. And that's when he jerked me over, not far from the kids' bedroom. And I was praying to God, praying to God, they never went over there and realized there was any kids in the house. And they kept hitting him, they kept hitting him. Every time I kept talking, things around his head because my eyes were adjusting at this point. And I'm able to see more. And what they were wrapping around his face was what? And they just kept wrapping around his face over and over. So basically, like, this part of his face down was completely wrapped up. I don't even know if he was able to breathe. I know that when they wanted an answer from him, they jerked it down like this. But before then, I don't even know if he was able to breathe. And they cuffed his head on his back. And I don't know what they used to do that. I didn't see. And then they got him down the stairs and left me upstairs with a guy holding a blade on me. And I could hear him hitting him in the living room and yelling, but I couldn't tell what was being said. And then they told them to bring me down. And that's when he brought me down. And it was like they were just using me as a tool to talk to him so that he would talk. And I don't even know about what. What kind of questions were they asking? Tell me what you know. Tell me what you know. I know that you know, but they would never let on to what. And then that's when his dad got brought up. He had one of ours put behind bars. So now I'm taking his. Earlier in the interview, Samantha states that she suspects Ibarra's father is involved. Yet now she gives a specific motive for the kidnapping, namely revenge against Ibarra's father. You'll notice in this interview, Samantha gives important pieces of information much later than a normal person would. Samantha's strategy is one of throwing out small pieces of information, hoping for follow-up questions, and when the detective does not take the bait, Samantha is forced to later elaborate spontaneously, which the detective will notice as not only being unnatural, but a sign of a made-up story. And they made him tell him where his ID was. And they pushed the lid and rolled people in my throat and said, Is he telling the truth? Is it long the truck? It is. It is. I promise you never take it out of the truck. Please don't kill me. It's in the truck. I promise. And they went out to his truck to make sure they, I guess, make sure they had the right house. And they asked him who I was, and he said I was his wife. And they said, So she's just married into your family. She's not actually blood your family. And he said, No, that's my wife. They said, do you want us to have to kill her, too? And he said, no, please don't, please don't. How are my kids? And they hit him in the mouth. Are my kids okay? And they hit him in the mouth, and he said, we wouldn't fucking touch a child. And they flew out of his mouth. I don't know if it was a tooth, or if it was just spit or blood. Something flew out of his mouth, because they had the lights on down there. And that's when they started cutting my clothes off and making me stand in front of him naked. <laughs> and it just felt like it, they were just using me to taunt him. And then when they made me go outside to tell him bye, I just knew they were going to shoot him right there. They had him in the execution position on his knees. I never heard a gunshot. <laughs> but they took me back upstairs before they left. When did they start tying you up? In spite of Samantha's elaborate story of her being used by the three trespassers as a tool by which to manipulate Ibarra, the detective's only questions about when Samantha was tied up. The detective is looking for inconsistencies in Samantha's story, as her nonverbal communication tells him that the story is likely made up. As Samantha's story includes her being stripped naked and moved out of the house, her being tied up early in the break-in would be a clear inconsistency. Samantha notices this line of questioning and henceforth alters some parts of her story, such as claiming that her legs were not yet tied up, so that the sequence of events would be more believable in light of being tied up. As soon as they got me out of the bed. What all did they do? What all did they tie up when they got you out of the bed? They wrapped it around my mouth <coughs> and tied my hip on my back. 
and I didn't tuck my legs together until right before they left me there. Right before they, I had to wobble over to get my phone because they were forcing me to walk and things on my own and just helping me steady myself because I couldn't catch myself. My hands were tied by my back. My mouth was tied. I'm surprised it didn't split my mouth. It was tied so tight. She didn't recognize the voice. I, I, I tried. I tried listening to everything. They forced him to tell me not to call the police. And he said, don't call the police. And they punched him in the mouth with, with the gun. And said, that's not what I said for you to tell you. He said, please tell me what to say again. Please just repeat it. So they repeated it. And I couldn't understand what they were saying because they were so close to his face and growling in his ear. He said, Sam, don't call the police. I don't care what happens. Don't call the police because they'll come back and they'll kill all the kids. <laughs> promise me. And he was screaming at me. And I was like, I promise. I promise. And then so they took me back upstairs. And there was a bunch more yelling and cussing. And I couldn't understand a bunch, any of it. I don't, once they took me upstairs, I couldn't understand what they were saying. And then did every once in a while I would pick up Ernie's name. And anybody that knows little Ernie, unless it's his family, doesn't call him Ernie. They call him Dagon. And when they were leaving, did you hear a vehicle? I didn't up? hear a vehicle. I didn't see a vehicle. I thought they would steal his truck. And that I would be able to get it tracked that way. Because I never saw a vehicle at all. Okay, you didn't hear anyone leave or anything? No. When I called my mom, I was terrified they were going to come back in. I hung up on her like twice because they did come back in the house rummaging around and digging through stuff. But I never heard or saw a vehicle until Brett showed up. That was the first vehicle I heard. So I don't know if they were close by or if they just parked a few roads over and carried him there. I don't know. What was he wearing when, when, when they went to bed? He, he had his boxers on and he said, I need something to drink. What about you? I was like, oh, that would be so great. What and so you? he put on his jeans that he had been wearing that day. And he went downstairs. And he came back up and he sat down. He handed me my soda. And we sat and we drank the soda and smoked a cigarette. So it was probably 12, 15 12.20 before we actually laid down and turned the lights out. He handed me his phone and he was like, I have these hunts on my phone that you can do. And I was like, that sounds really, really good. This is an app that's pretty elaborate that we play. And he was like, I haven't done any of them. You can play those. I know because mine, my phone got stolen last week. So mine's like locked in transition. I've contacted support, but I can't play. So I downloaded the other version of it so that it doesn't mess up my version. And so I played that while he's playing that, but I saved all my hunts so you could do those at least. Because his tablet wouldn't charge for whatever reason. It wouldn't turn on. He dropped it and the, the button on it it's like dips it in and now he can't turn it on that way. You have to like plug it in and unplug it. For it to light the screen up, for you to be able to swipe it. So he messed with that, he couldn't get it to come on, so I couldn't play it on there. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'll do a couple of those, but I'm so tired. And he started laughing, he goes, I hear that. And then the cat came in and jumped in bed with us, and he started petting the cat, and I was like, yeah, I've done three, and you have five, plus you got a bunch in your inbox, and I'm really tired, but I appreciate you doing that for me. No. And when he came back upstairs, he had his pants on upstairs. And, and he didn't take them off before he got back in bed, which is fairly normal. I mean, he doesn't... These pants that he usually wears has this fuzzy lining inside, so they're similar to pajama pants. Uh, Fleece-lined cargo pants, and... If he has to put his clothes back on before he goes downstairs or something, he just sleeps on them. Okay, so he doesn't, he can't. He didn't take those pants off. But the pants that are laying on the floor in the living room, those, those are, are his. Those are the ones that he had on. Yes. 
the uh, and when when they drove you downstairs when to see him whatever what did he have on? Yeah, he still had his pants on. He still had his pants on. Uh-huh. Okay. Do you don't know why they took his pants off? No. I know there was yelling, but I don't. There's no way to, to see what's going on upstairs without trying to get over to the balcony, and I had somebody holding a knife on me. Mm-hmm. And didn't want to draw any attention to the kids' room at all. Right. And the only place that you can see into the living room is right next to the kids' bedroom door. Okay. Now, could you hear anything at all that they were saying or what they were talking about as far as... Not when I wasn't in the room. Okay. When you were in the room, what were they talking about? What were they saying? Mostly just... Your dad caused this. Keep this in mind. Your dad caused this. And then he would throw jabs at him about being a terrible husband or unappreciative of his life. You had a wife that loves you. Look at her face. Isn't she beautiful? Look how much she loves you. Look how much she's crying. Even after her husband's death, Samantha feels the need to continue painting a picture in which she's an ideal wife that is going unappreciated by her husband. This is an example of how cluster B personality disorders are much less useful in criminal activities than psychopathy. The latter would drive a criminal toward the goal of getting away with the crime, while the former emphasizes ego-focused goals, such as painting oneself as a good person. And he didn't want to look at me. And so they didn't begin. I know you said something about some money or... Yeah, he said, what do I have to do? Please don't kill me, what do I have to do? And he said, $20,000, you want, you want to know what you have to do? Can you come up with $20,000 in the next five minutes? And he's kind of laughed. What's caused the pain of the kid? And he said, no, I can't come up with $20,000 in five minutes. You can take my truck, you can take whatever's in my wallet, I don't have much. But it's the only thing that's worth the value I've got. The, um, when their voice, you know, think back, you know, you're looking at these guys and you remember the sound of their voice. What did they sound like? What did they sound oh like? Black, Hispanic. <coughs> One of them definitely sounded white. Mm-hmm. Like the ringleader mm-hmm. that was making all the orders. One of them could have either been black or just raised in the hood because anytime he said anything it was very gangster sounding very he didn't finish his words he had like instead of adding a g it always ended in an n and it just the way he said things The, uh, I know you said when they were, they, they had a handgun, never. Yeah, and then the other two had box knives. Okay. And I think one of them, they may have stolen off of his pants. Because it was like a red folding blade knife that he buys like crazy. If he loses one at work, he goes and buys another one because he's a fan of a you know, locking blade and you can't open them unless you know how to do it. So the kids couldn't hurt themselves on it if they got it off of his pants. And he always kept them on his pants because he had open boxes and things that work. And God, I used it for everything. I hit, hey, toss me in the half, and it just turned into his typical pocket knife. And the guy that sawed his hair off and threw in the floor was using a red knife in, exactly like that. So I don't know if they brought it or if they stole it. And what did the hand guy? It was just black. I don't know anything about guns. Could you, you know the difference between like a revolver and an automatic? Oh, it was definitely like a police pistol. It was so whatever those are. Semi-automatic, so it wasn't a... It was small, barely bigger than his hand. He was a big guy, so I don't really know hmm. if that's a normal sized gun and he just has large hands, or... Where did they have him in? Where was he at down? When y'all were downstairs, where, where did they have him? No, right the beside the hardwood floor in the living room. Okay. Right there close to the front door? Yeah. Okay. Over close to And they had me standing in the doorway when they cut my clothes off. Mm-hmm. 
right there in front of him, forcing him to watch, holding his head back and forcing him to watch. And you don't want anything to happen to your pretty little wife, do you? No, I don't want to walk right. And they forced me to come and kneel down in front of him, like, shut me down onto my knees. So we were face to face. I was on the hardwood floor, he was on the carpet. What were they saying when you had... That's when they were asking him about the money and... And when he asked about the kids, because now I'm here in the living room with him. So he asked about the kids, and that's when they hit him in the face, and it looked like he was, they knocked a tooth out. It was when I was right there face to face that I got the majority of what they were saying. Now where was he in the living room when they were hitting him and striking him in the face? Right there, close to the door, on his knees. Was one was holding him and the other one was hitting him. Over by the couch or over by the fireplace? Or no, uh, closer to the door, like, not far from where his hair was. Because the guy pulled his hair up, mm -hmm. sawed it off, and dropped it beside him. Right beside Dago. Okay, so that's where you saw Pretty him much where he was, and that's where I saw them hitting him in the face with a pistol. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you didn't hear a weapon discharge or anything? No. Like no, I would have. I would have lost it. But you didn't hear me believe or anything? I never heard speaking. a vehicle at all until Brett showed up. Door slamming or anything? Like no, not, not except when they sent the other guy that had been holding an eye on me out to check and see if. His ID did say that he was already at Vera. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know him on the side? No. So that's why they kept asking him? That's why they kept asking him and making him tell him his name and ask my name. And even ask him where his ID was because they wanted to make sure they had the right person. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anybody we knew at all. They forced him to show his ID. The, uh... Like I said, when I was talking about earlier about, you know, we have to, you know, look at close friends, family, things like that first to try to get a line on things. Um, one of the things they need to do, obviously, I'm going to need to take some pictures, you know, where they were holding up to your neck and your wrist. It was on them. this side. Uh, they and he slapped me in the face on this side, but my aunt said it didn't bruise or anything. Okay. Definitely felt like it should have been right in my mouth. Okay. Like I said, what I'm going to do is just take some pictures of hands where they found you and your legs where they found you and work there on your neck and everything on that. Um, one of the other things also that I need to do, uh, like I said, we just have to do everything we can to rule everybody out first also, is um, I need to do, uh, just check your hands, make sure there's not any blood or anything on your hands. Okay? Not even all the jewelry or anything like that, no injuries, marks, cuts, anything. Okay. Um, another thing, what I need to do is uh, since there was a handgun that you said that was involved in that, I need to do what's called a GSR test, which is a, a gunshot residue kit. Just check your hands, make sure you I've never ready. held a gun in my life, so. Okay. Well, what I'll need to do, would you be willing to consent to that? Yes. Just, just let me test your ear. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get him found, I don't sure. care. We may have our problems, but I would never put it through this. Sure. What does the GSR test do? What it does is just check your hands to make sure that you don't have any gunshot residue. Well, yeah, but what, do you put something on that changes color? No, what it is, what it's actually a kit that I had actually taken and I sent it to the lab and they'll tell me if I was, you know, if you handle a gun. I thought it put like some kind of a blue light on TV anyway. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit different. What this is here, like, so this is what's called an authorization to release information or to gain uh, the GSR kill in there. And so you're calling for Samantha Wolford? Is that correct? Yeah, I thought my ID switched up, but it's hyphen hyper. Okay. And your Wolford is spelled W O. H O F O R B. And then half an hour. Okay. I'm E A R R A. Yes. What's your birthday? 
Bring her in for questioning. Mm -hmm. Are you going to have to bring her in for questioning? Yes, ma'am. We need to speak, speak with everybody we can to find out what's going on as far as what's happening. GSR kit for your hands and then also to photograph your injuries to your hands, your face, and your legs. Is there any injuries to my face? Well, I've we'll just got to photograph it. My aunt said she didn't see anything, but that's for the right here for you, me. Sure. I haven't even looked in the mirror. Here's your, where you can see what I have to have. Mouth. But they had my pants, my ankle down over the top of pants, so I'm sure it really didn't do anything. This has what, the gun powder or gun oil or? There's lots of different components that are in bullets, like for bullet, for handguns, fired, all the different, there's quite a few different chemicals that make up uh, the composition of a uh, projectile or a uh, bullet. And that's basically what that tells for is to see if there's any, uh, what's called gunshot residue, which makes up all these different type of chemicals. What it'll do is it'll tell us if. Uh, when's the last time you fired a gun? Uh, 
I never have. You never shot a gun in your life? I did one that was a fake gun on set of a show, uh, back when they had that zombie film going on in Pittsburgh. Yeah. But I only shot out paper around so it turned into fire. But you never had an actual fire an actual... An actual handgun fire. or shotgun or any... No. Nothing on Nothing on What about uh, Ernie? Does he own any weapons? Not that I'm currently aware of. He's a felon. He's not supposed to have anything. Has he had anything in the past? Rifles, pistols, shotguns? His dad brought a handgun around like uh, a year ago. And I didn't like it being in the house, so I traded it off to somebody for one of those Eric hot tubs. Mm -hmm. And then he just let it sit there on the porch because he was mad at me for trading off the gun. So I gave it to my mother. The, uh, if you, uh, just need, you can go ahead and just take your jacket off the phone and send the phone around. Uh, I don't know if they ended up cutting my shoulder at all. When they were cutting the shirt off, I was mm -hmm. pretty adrenaline filled. They cut along the, the oh, neckline yeah. on the shoulder on the shirt, and then got uh, screw this and just jerked the whole thing off. What's the right there on your face? Where they were you? Yeah, right here. He open hand slapped me right here. Is there anything? Let me turn the face away from that. I mean, in general, I got my face shoved into a carpet, slammed down. On your hand, if you want to get your whole mouth, I'll care for Okay, and look at them one at a time. Okay, you flip over. What about oh, your looks like they weren't in cutting. What about your legs? Where did they bind you? Up high or down low? No, right around my legs. the entire shin area. Is there any marks on your legs or anything? No. It was a wide uh it real wide stretch material. Okay. And you'd have your I guess your pants on. I had jump pants, pants on. on. It was double knotted, but after I had my hands unbound and stuff, I was able to undo it myself. Do you, you have any other injuries or anything? No, mostly he just jerked me around by the hair a lot and pressed a knife against my throat. It really felt like he was just using me as a tool to force him to do what he wanted. Let me take some pictures of the top of your head there. Did he rip any hair out? Or yes, head? a lot. And I just pulled my hair back because it was. He almost had my complete. Oh, I had it in a bun. And he almost had my complete bun pulled completely out. So there's not any of it pulled out that you know of? Yes, he pulled a lot of my hair out. I don't know like, if you could visually see it. But it was right here where most of it was pulled out. <clears throat> Hello? Yeah? Who is this? Just tell them I'll call you. Um, I'm at the sheriff's office right now. The sheriff will call you and let you know what's going on. No. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. He said he's in jail? No. Most of like I said, it was right here in the center where he kept grabbing and yanking. And yes, he pulled a lot of my hair off. I'm surprised my scalp isn't bleeding. 
While Samantha claims she was grabbed by the hair and swung around, resulting in injuries and lost hair, these claims are improbable. For one, the police did not notice any significant injuries after the incident. But more importantly, the three men involved in the incident are supreme gentlemen, so to speak. Samantha enticed these men to kill her husband with stories of domestic abuse. The three men, you might even call them white knights, were all adamant about being anti-violence against women and were unlikely to actually hurt Samantha during the kidnapping. Moreover, Samantha's complaining about her supposed injury while her husband's whereabouts are unknown is another red flag for the detectives. No one complains about a paper cut as they watch their house burn down. That's how he was forcing me to go his direction and do what he wanted. to work things out, we decided to work things out. He's had access to my phone to go through my phone. And when y'all were, were, were split up, was there anybody? No, I go out and visit my mom a lot. I didn't go to the bar there. Okay. And I met quite a few people that were friends and stuff, but nobody, nobody that was anything special. Nobody that you were intimate with or no. like that, that would have some kind of an attachment to you no. or anything? Okay. The, and as far as you yourself, you didn't have any involvement in this whatsoever. No. You didn't. You and Ernie didn't get into a fight. No. Things didn't get out of hand. You didn't. No. You didn't shoot him. You didn't stab him. You didn't hit him with a bat. No. A piece uh, of can't. metal. Kick him in the face. You didn't do anything no. that caused any kind of injuries. No. You. You're positive about that. Yes. Like I said, I if I'm not even saying any different about that. No. Right now, what we've got is I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what they call tracking track scent and everything. I've got those dogs that are probably already up at your house right now that came from the prison in New Boston. Okay. What That's what I asked that guy, one of the other deputies was, can I give you some of his clothes? And they're going and to go they're search they're the area where his they're cell phone they're came. Gonna, they're going to be tracking that area where his cell phone and they're going to be tracking the area there at the house. But what I have to make sure from you is that you have absolutely no involvement in this whatsoever. No. So you, like I said, you two weren't fussing, you weren't no. fighting, didn't get out of hand, you didn't punch him, kick him, stab him, shoot no. him, nothing like that. I'm not going to find out anything any different later once no. we get there. Because the deputies, you know, they're out there right now, you know, basically searching your house from top to bottom for every piece of physical evidence that we can find. To anything that will help them fight yeah. Sure. Well, well actually, so that's why I want to make sure, because we're going to be checking your phone records, your family's phone records. Was there anybody in your family that's involved in this? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Not that you're aware of? No. Okay. Would there be any reason why any of your family members wouldn't be involved in what hurt her? Brett's had problems with him in the past, but as far as taking it to the point of kidnapping him, no. Okay. So you think, well, obviously you know Brett's boy, so you... Brett's I would know Brett, yes. Okay. So you, Very well. So you feel like, you don't feel like Brett had any no. involvement in this? What about your mom or anybody? Any of them got any problems with Bernie? No. To the point that I want to do something They've like had their little problems or whatever, but nothing that would go to this level. No. Okay. And I'm not going to find any kind of evidence to the contrary that no. you were involved in. What about a polygraph? Would you be willing to take a polygraph? To, yes. To prove to me that you had no 
involvement, no knowledge, no nothing. Yes. Involvement is correct. Correct. The and like I said, that's probably going to be a possibility. You know, depending on what we're Sorry, my face gets attached to my phone and it vibrates every time somebody makes a status update. But part of the procedure also, like I said, we're going to be, you know, checking your phone records for the last few months. You know, is we're going to find any kind of, you know, establish anything as far as anybody that's involved in this and not connected to your phone? No. Okay. You sure about that? Yeah. No. I would recognize a voice that I knew. No, I'm talking about as far as you being involved in, in, his, in your husband's experience. No. So you had absolutely nothing to do with this? No, I had absolutely nothing to do with this. I would not be this cooperative if I did. Okay. Well, I mean, just because a person cooperative doesn't mean they didn't do something. Obviously, if someone wants to throw us off. Have I thought about it? Have I thought about stabbing him? Oh, more than once. Okay. Have I thought about shooting him if I had a gun? Okay. The thought is, and I'm not going to say the thought hasn't crossed my mind. He's had me to the point that I wanted to kill his ass. Okay. And that's what happened last night? No. He didn't have you to that point last night? No. Time. We were not fighting at all. So what, and would, what would get you to the point where you'd want to shoot him or stab him? To see him lay his hands on my kids. When's the last time you did that? Back when I had him arrested. Okay. He hasn't played and I hands. informed the cops that he's got to stay away from me because after he, doing this to my kids... Mm-hmm. But he hasn't, he hasn't done no. that since? Okay. No. That was one of the stipulations on us getting back together. He is not allowed... To Discipline them at all. Okay. So as far as last night? No, we were getting along great. There was nothing. Okay. So I'm not going to find anything to the contrary to show nothing. Deputies aren't going to call me here in a few minutes and say, hey, look, what we found here on the scene is not matching what she's telling us. No. And the, the only thing on my phone that wouldn't say to the contrary is he sent me a text message that said, answer your GD phone. Because he said he called me over and over and over and over and over, and I wasn't answering when I was up at the hospital. As far as last but then night. when I got this was yesterday, right. and then when I got home, things were fine. I expected to walk into him being mad because mm-hmm. he swears he called me a million times and I didn't answer. But when I walked in the door, things were fine. Okay. How good, fun baby, and he was just so calm and happy and loving. Okay. Well, like I say, once the investigators are out there, then I gotta call him here in a few minutes and say, "Look, we found." Evidence out here to the country of what Samantha's telling you that that's what she's saying ain't what, what the scene's telling us. Because the scene's going to be able to, what you're telling me happened, and when they look at the scene out there, they'll be able to tell that that's what's, what's going on. Okay. Now, as far as you're not, you haven't lied to me about anything, no. you haven't forgotten anything, nothing, nothing you need to change, nothing you need to tell me that's any different about what's going on, what actually happened out there. No. So you didn't lay your hands on her? You no. Didn't touch you didn't have no. anybody touch her? No. You didn't have any involvement whatsoever no. in this? No. Not at all. Okay. And when the dogs come out there, they're not going to leave us out there, find them there in the house, under the house, no. the woods around the house, anything like that? God, I hope not. I hope he's found alive. Sure. Well, I hope so, too. But, um, but like I say, that's... Usually when we have things like this, you know, obviously because you're you were actually there when this happened, so that's why I mean I'm so I'm having to ask you all these tough I questions just, and, I and being rough on you on this because I need I to know understand. the truth. You know, I have to absolutely know the truth that you had no possible involvement in this whatsoever. No. Do you love her? I do. I wouldn't have gone back if I didn't. What what are you willing to do to help me find her? Whatever it takes. You don't know where he is? No, I don't. I wish I did. You're positive. I'm positive. You have absolutely no idea where he's at. No, I don't. Do you know who we can call to find where he's at? The only one I can think is Ernie, because they kept bringing him up. Other than that, you have no idea. Other than that, I have no idea. None. He doesn't have any friends. I don't go out much. The one friend that I do really have Mm -hmm. lives in Sulphur Springs. I don't like drama. I don't like having outside chaos, so I just stay home. I'm just a stay-at-home mom. The, as far as last night, y'all didn't have any kind of fights, no arguments, no nothing. No, nothing. Nothing, nothing to get to this point. No. To where the blood scene there in the living room, 
hair being cut off and blood in the living room, none of that? No. Had absolutely nothing to do with you? No. Your foster? Yes. And the clothing that you had on there, because we'll have to send your clothes to the lab and have it tested and make sure that, you know, there's no blood on there from him. Anything that's gonna, the lab's going to come back and say, look, you know, what we found on her clothing does not match her statement of what she's saying after the universe. And that just, that's not, not the case. No, it should be fine. It should be or it will be. I was right there, no, in front of him, no nose, right. nose with him. Right. And well, they I were can... punching him in the face with a gun. Right. And I understand that. I mean, if you've got some blood on you from that, they'll be able to tell by the if way it's... the blood's on you. If it came in sideways, upside down, cross you, whatever. Like if you two are right up here like me and you're this close together and they're punching and hitting you, the way the blood comes on someone, the way we tell the lab what this happens when they examine your clothes and look for blood, gunshot residue, anything, uh, hairs, fibers, whatever type of evidence, when they look at your clothing, they'll be able to tell us, okay, look, this is what we found, you know, based upon The only stuff. type of DNA from him that should be able to be found in my clothes mm -hmm. would be seen. And what about the blood? How were you up close with him when they punched him? Yes. Okay, so you think there may be some blood on him? Well, I didn't, you know, inspect for right. splatter or anything like that. When they jerked me away from him and cut my clothes off, I never touched him so again. So it's possible that So did. there may be. Okay. But is it because I laid my hands on him? No, my hands were tied behind my back. When and I'm watching this guy punch him in the face with the guy over and over. Okay. How did it make you feel? Horrible. I was hysterically bawling. So it didn't, didn't, didn't make you feel glad or no. there was some torture? Or no. Because you told me that you felt good about you know, wanting to stab him, kill him. At some point in time, everybody sure. loses their temper. But have I ever acted out and hurt anybody? Right. No. And you can look at my record on that. Right. I have one count of criminal mischief, and that was because I tossed my keys to somebody and let them use my car. Sure. And they didn't have a license. Now, when they cut your shirt off of you, how, I mean, was it violent, or did they just yes. take their time? And just no, well, they jerked it out and started slashing at it with this okay. apparently dull box cutter, and then when it didn't work, ripped it off over my head and threw it to the side. So it wasn't completely cut in half? Or no, they started cutting yeah. like they were going to cut it down or across, and the blade wasn't working, so they said, and ripped it off over my head. But as far as tonight, you had nothing to do with no. this experience. You don't know who did anything. No. You're positive about that? Yes. So, you look me in the face. I need to know the truth. Did you have anything to do with Ernie's disappearance? No. And I did you have anything to do with his death tonight? No. Death? Mm -hmm. He's dead? I don't know. That's what I'm trying to find out. Yes, if he is dead, you, no. Do you think he's alive? I hope so. Did you have anything to do with it? No. You had nothing to do with his no. disappearance? Nothing if you know if if God forbid he is found deceased, did you have anything to do with it? No. Did you hire someone to do it? No. You had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing. Then I pray to God that they're just like holding him to get it in that. Yeah, I really, really don't want to have to play this. Funeral for my husband. Well, I'm saying I, the reason why I'm having to ask you these tough questions is because I need to know. I need to be absolutely. I know that they always look at this house, I, I have to be absolutely <laughs> positively sure you had nothing to do with this. I know. No, I not There's not anybody that you can think of and I can call or talk to other than her. If they, that's the only person they brought up. The only thing that's the only thing they said that had any validity other than the other guy's name was some guy's name was Luke. Okay. What did they say about Luke? He was up there. He was the one that had me at knife point. Okay, so that's the guy and they said, said, Luke, I need you. Okay. And he left me upstairs. So you don't know anybody that I don't know any other names. Anybody that, that Dagon hangs out with named Luke. But no, he's only got like two friends, and one is named Josh, and the other one's name is Brandon, and we never see those unless we run into them at town. As far as if he's been hanging out with anybody, his sister and her boyfriend, Lainey. Well, what I need to know 
me to get to do for me is um, just get you to write me out a statement about everything that's. I just did that. When you wrote something out? Uh, yes, I wrote it out to one of the officers. How much? How much of a statement was it? It was a full page. A full page. What happened? Well, what I need you to do for me is um, make me a list of everybody, you know, friends, family, contact numbers. Uh, his boss, where he works at Little Caesars. His boss, where he works at the Talco Woodcraft. Uh, his There's mom's, like four bosses. That's at Little Caesars, everybody's name. But that I don't know. Can, I don't everybody's know. name that you can think of. Start making me a list of everybody where he works at Little Caesars Woodcraft. Uh, his mom, Lane, uh, numbers, everything that you can think of. Okay. Um, I'm gonna need to take this one for just a second, okay? And I'll bring it right back to you, okay? Okay. Okay. And, uh, what I get you to do for me is so just uh, just take this right here, and like I say, just start writing down everybody you can think of. You know, his bosses, where he works, phone numbers. Why do you need my call? And uh, I just got to check it real quick. Okay. Uh, and just start thinking of everything that you could possibly think of: friends, families, uh, everybody that I can contact that might be able to help us track him down and find out where he's at. Okay. Need some else to drink or anything? My mom brought me something to eat and she's here, so. I don't know any numbers without my problem. Okay, well, I'll bring it back to you. If you can just start I don't, making I a list. I can't. Of, the only number I've memorized is my mother's. Okay, well, if you can just make a list of names for me friends, families, parents, you know, and everybody. With me having a new phone, I don't have very many of the numbers I would need. Okay. Thank you for watching this episode of The Case of Samantha Wolford. If you liked this video and want to see the next episode, please like and subscribe. If this video performs well, I'll continue the case. I have probably uh, two or three more hours of the Samantha Wolford interrogation, and then I have the interrogations of the three men as well. I thought maybe I'd do each of those individually rather than put out a big 10 hour long video, just, just to see responses as I make the content. Otherwise, I'll move on to another interrogation. It's really up to what you guys want. Thanks again. You guys are true wildcats.